You may be seated. The Gospel comes from the Gospel according to John, chapter 11, verses 28 through 36. Hear the word of the Lord. And when she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and is calling you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews were with her in the house, consoling her, Mary saw him and rose quickly to go out, and they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her weep also weeping, he was deeply moved in the spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. This ends the reading of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <coughs> and now I'm on part seven of my uh, sermon series, based on the fine book by Diana Butler Bass, entitled Christianity for the Rest of Us. As those who were here may remember, I preached first on the topic of hospitality, reminding us that uh, hospitality is important because it requires us to open our hearts to people that we may not know and, and occasionally on enemies. Dr. Bass uh, saw a church where uh, she was moved when she saw a a uh, senior citizen in a wheelchair being pushed by uh, another member, not a, a relative, who was uh, dressed up in goth with, uh, you know, with piercings and tattoos. And she said, uh, a, a church that welcomes people regardless of what they look like is a church that is filled with hospitality. Then I talked about the issue of discernment, the idea that when making a decision that we shouldn't just, uh, you know, make a flip decision, that sometimes we need to deeply consider the decisions that we make and consider them in the light of prayer and thought, and even if it means that it takes a little bit of time. I then uh, talked about, uh, about, uh, um, about contemplation and said that uh, in the churches that uh, Diana Bass went to, many of the churches had returned to uh, some of the ancient traditions of, of, uh, of their experiences. One church she went to uh, that was growing rapidly, both numerically and spiritually, had returned to many of the old Celtic prayers and old uh, Scottish, and Pres uh, Scottish and Irish prayers and songs because those were moving and brought people into a closer relationship to God. Fourth, I talked a little bit about, uh, in my fourth sermon, I talked about healing. And in that sermon, I, I talked about uh, my own personal experience with healing when I was nine years old and in hospital, and talked about other experiences that I had, ultimately making the conclusion that uh, even in the midst of tragedy, everything will be okay. I then preached on justice, and I, I talked about how a church that does justice, who practices what it preaches, doesn't just make pronouncements about what needs to be done, but actually goes out and does these things. 
is a church that is affected by the gospel. Last Sunday I talked about, um, about <clears throat> the difficult challenges that our society faces where people are polarized based on theology and, and based on religion and, and based on politics and how uh, a church that welcomes people regardless of where they come from. And uh, then I played that video and, and reminded us that it takes all kinds of kinds to make up a church. This, uh, this morning I would like to talk a little bit about, um, about worship. Now, like many Generation Xers, that's my generation, I like that, Generation Xers, it makes us sound cool. Uh, and, you know, the older we get, the least cool, the, 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 the less cool we become. But those of us who are Generation Xers who grew up in the mainline church, we remember that, uh, that Sunday was an important part of our worship. My mother mostly would take me and, uh, and my older brother and two younger sisters uh, to Sunday school, which was held like our first church prior to worship. And my, my mother insisted that we dress up. I have uh, several colorful snapshots to prove it, that in fact um, uh, we had to dress up. I'm the cute one. <laughs> but as you can see, you know, we had to dress up uh, in mostly polyester, which was uncomfortable. And, and we had to wear uh, clip-on ties, starchy white shirts. But we were required to attend worship every single Sunday, and we needed to sit together as a family, all five or sometimes six of us. My father made excuses about football or something, so often failed to attend. Occasionally, uh, most of the time, our worship services were led by a fine organist by the name of Mrs. Dun uh, Dunlap, who at the time I was a kid was about 100 years old, and when I was ordained 20 years later, she was still about 100 years old. She was a lovely lady, but she just refused to either retire or die. She was a wonderful woman. <laughs> uh, but she sat behind uh, the choir playing the organ. Fast. I remember how fast she was. It wasn't slow. We had to sing Amazing Bass, that's what the sound it was going boom, boom, boom. She wanted to get out. The service lasted about an hour, and then it was followed by a coffee hour. Now, during my time as a member of that church, I can't remember any details of any sermon. But I do remember one sermon that was preached. Now, that sermon was preached by my pastor at the time, Tom Lang, who served the church for more than 20 years. He always would dress in a collar and always would have the uh, the uh, Geneva, you know, the little white uh, tabs down uh, when he would preach. And the, the sermon I remember came when I was 25 years old and was being ordained as a minister. Now this pastor, he preached the sermon at my ordination and he talked about the story of his parents. You see, his parents had been uh, missionaries and as they were flying to uh, East Asia on a missionary trip, their, the airplane that they were on uh, crashed into the Hudson Bay outside of New York. And uh, uh, everyone, of course, was killed, including both of his parents. During the 25 years that I had known this man, I never knew that his parents had passed away like that. He never talked about himself. His sermons were based on scriptural expositions. He would read the latest uh, theologians from the, uh, from the 16th century, and he would talk about uh, the Bible. His sermons were never intellectual, but only that one where he talked about himself did I feel the passion of what it means to be a Christian. Now, Dr. Bass, she writes, for too long, mainline Protestants equated worship with thinking about God. Now, in, at least in some worship 
places, their hearts, their whole capacity of being a human are learning to experience God. Now, when we go to Mantri, the, uh, the head of the, the Mantri, the, uh, the director of the Mantri Conference Center, he, he always gives a speech, and he always does the exact same speech every single time. Um, but in that speech, he talks about uh, how Scottish and Irish Christians often speak about worship as a, as a thin place. Meaning, it is a place where the separation from God and humanity is narrow, thinned out. Therefore, as one of my favorite Christian authors says, Marcus Borg, he writes, The purpose of worship is to create a sense of sacred, a thin place. Worship, then, is not necessarily intellectual. It is an exercise of the heart. <coughs> Worship's... Services don't need to be overly intellectual. It can be emotional. Our, our hymns, our, our prayers, our sermons even are meant to, as Marcus Borg says, create a thin place where our hearts are open. In fact, um, I'm often moved uh, to tears by an exceptionally beautiful worship service. And this is not something that we should be ashamed of. We learn in today's lesson that, in fact, Jesus wept. Commentators do not universally agree uh, this, uh, what this is, the significance of these two words. Many say the, the shortest sentence uh, in the entire Bible. But some argue that it was a demonstration of Jesus' humanity, while others suggest that he wept because he was angry. Still others say that it was because Jesus was filled uh, with compassion and sorrow, the loss of a friend. However, all of these interpreters agree that this was an emotional experience for Jesus. Jesus was awash with emotion, uh, but this was not an isolated event, an occurrence. Jesus, in fact, uh, wept elsewhere in the Bible. Uh, he wept in, uh, in Luke. He came near Jerusalem, the city, and he wept over it, saying, if you even, uh, you, even if you, uh, you had only recognized, even you had recognized this day, the things that make for peace, but now they're hidden. Uh, he wept over Jerusalem. Worship for me is, is bowing down in the midst of our human fragility. This awkward pull between our own humanity and the undeniable pull of God calling us to acknowledge the awesome wonder around us. Biologist Dr. Francis Collin, Collins, a, a, noticed, uh, a noted uh, uh, geneticist, I practiced that word a million times so that I would say it right, a noted geneticist is now the head of the National Institute of Health. When he was younger, he was an atheist, but he slowly moved towards Christianity. He describes his conversion to Christ in the book, The Language of God. On a beautiful day, he writes, as I was walking through the Cascade Mountains during my first trip west of the Mississippi, Mississippi, the majesty and beauty of God's creation overwhelmed my resistance. He says, I rounded a corner and saw a beautiful and unexpected frozen waterfall, hundreds of feet high. I knew my search was over. The next morning, I knelt in the dewy grass. The sun, as the sun rose, I surrendered myself to God, to Jesus. For me, worship is a response to the awesome power of creation. When we come into contact with a thin place before God and humanity, we have no choice but to kneel in the dewy grass and surrender ourselves to Jesus Christ. Now, Dr. Bass, when he, she was writing this book, she actually went into these churches and she interviewed these uh, pastors of churches, and she interviewed one pastor in a church by the name of Pastor Eric, who was at a church in Scottsdale, Arizona, and 
It was a congregational church, a UCC church, and one that she attended when she was a child. Uh, the pastor, Eric, became, uh, uh, described his church when he arrived as a boring mainline church. He became distressed by the fact, by this fact, and, and he began to think seriously about worship. His church is now growing rapidly, and the worship services are a blend of, of contemporary and traditional. He uses a variety of music styles, art, drama, video, and inspiring messages. He was interviewed by Dr. Bass and he described going on a retreat to Oregon uh, where he questioned himself about worship and said, what is the basis of worship? As he was asking this, he, he stared into the water on the coast and the largest bass he had ever seen swam past, leaving the water rippling in its wake. I stood up, said Eric, and gasped at a sense of awe and wonder that this provoked, and a surge of adrenaline went through my body. This is the foundation of worship, he writes. If you can take an hour on Sunday morning and open people to an experience, a quarter second, he writes, of awe, wonder, and surrender that you yourself have experienced, it is accomplished. Too often, we as Christians are told that the best way to experience God is through our minds. We are asked to believe in certain sets of dogma. And oftentimes we are given these texts and say to memorize them. Ask the confirmation class. I don't know, Amber, if you were in my confirmation class, but I think I asked you uh, long ago to memorize a creed and write one, and, and you had to stand before the, uh, the session. Now, now you're uh, older and getting married and, and having a, a baby, and, and I can imagine that experience of standing up and saying what you believe and talking about it. But you see, worship doesn't have to be what we talk about. It doesn't have to be what we, uh, what we read in a book. It doesn't have to be only that. It can be something so much more. Why do I believe in Jesus Christ? It's not necessarily the, the fact that I read something somewhere. It's because I experienced a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I experienced a moment in time where awe overwhelmed me, where a sense of wonder overwhelmed me, where I came face to face with an understanding that God is good and Jesus Christ is a powerful healing Savior. It was a moment in time when I experienced the magical wonder of Christ Jesus. The sermons, the readings, the creeds only reinforce what was already deep within myself. This sense that God is there and God is good. I can continue to experience that awesome wonder of God in my relationships with other people, in my experiences in worship, in my moments of grace that go on in my life, and even in the mundane reality of the world. There are times when I experience God both in tears and yawns and in joy and in sorrow, sickness and health by my acts. To love and to worship God means more than just understanding it here. It means that it's overwhelming our very being. Sometimes our thin places are experienced powerfully in our churches. But sometimes these thin places are experienced elsewhere in the world. Like Pastor Eric seeing the bass jumping out of the water and the water rippling. It's what we do with those experiences that make worship 
when we see the wonder of God and we bow down on our knees in the dewy grass, as Dr. Collins did, and <coughs> surrender ourselves to Jesus Christ. When we weep at the wonder, at the pain, at the sorrow, at the joy, at the wonderful, chaotic, mixed up world that we find ourselves in, when we take the very small moments of our lives, a child dressing up like Cinderella and going to a play, a, a, a girl walking up with a chalice and banging it down, a person carrying two cute little girls carrying a, a rusty chain and dropping it, a boy carrying a, a, a sword, the bells, even if they're not perfect, even if it's not the most wonderful thing that you've heard, the, the joys, the sorrows, the day-to-day -day life experiences sometimes will make us bow down upon the dewy grasses of our life and surrender ourselves to Jesus Christ. That is what God calls worship. Amen.